1776 was a very important year. Very important year. July the 1st, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia. And they began the process to declare their freedom from Great Britain. The next day on July the 2nd, they voted in favor of a motion to declare their independence. And then on July the 4th, after debating that motion and revising the motion for two days, Thomas Jefferson presented the, the final draft. And they declared the freedom from Great Britain. And that was on July the 4th. They adopted that Declaration of Independence. About a month later, August the 2nd, most of them signed the document. Some would sign it later. There was a couple that never did sign it. There was one that signed it and later recanted because he was sent to prison. I'm grateful of what happened in 1776. Aren't you? I'm very grateful. This morning, I'm going to be bringing a message on the subject of blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We do live in the land of the free, the home of the brave. These treasured words describe the land in which we live, the land of the free, and the home of the brave. I've selected a few songs that I believe will complement the message that I want to bring this morning. I am really praying hard that the message will truly speak to the hearts of each and every individual that hears and watches this message. So these songs, as they're played, you're welcome to sing along, or you're welcome to just listen to them, whichever you'd prefer to do. So let's go ahead and start, please. My country, tis a big, sweet land.
God make this nation stand. Would you stand with me and let's sing together America the Beautiful. across the land would read and pray to start their day and in the schools it wasn't gunshots that echoed down the hall it was I pledge allegiance to the flag and prayer was not against the law you know Lord we don't understand all that's going on in America today all we read and hear but wisdom comes to those who hold to truth and godly fear we sing America the Beautiful, and she's still that to me. But that beauty came from the grace you shed to keep us brave and free. So Lord, this is my prayer again today. Please bless America again and keep her beautiful in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Trouble that 
she's in Wash her pretty face And dry her eyes And then God bless America again Oh, please wash her pretty face And dry her eyes And then God bless America again I want you to look with me in Psalms 33. Psalms 33, and we'll look at verse 12. Psalms 33 and verse 12. What we're about to read is a very powerful statement. Go ahead and pull up the scripture, Raymond, on that verse as well. Notice what it says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the rest of the verse says, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. When we read this verse of Scripture, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, it should bring joy to us. Amen? Should it not? It should bring joy to us. But what if you're living in a nation whose God is not the Lord. If you live in a nation whose God is not the Lord, then it's not going to bring joy at all. And I know that many of us here today would have a question of whether or not America is still a nation whose God is the Lord. And I think that's a legitimate question for sure. We sung earlier, God bless America. We listened to Rosie as she sung, God bless America again. Now notice the scripture, what kind of nation that God will bless. And I did not say this. I'm just reading from the Scripture. The nation that God will bless, the Scripture says, is a nation whose God is the Lord. I've learned a long time ago that God will not bless wickedness. Can you say amen to that? I've learned that God will not bless sin. If you want to do what God will bless, you do what God will bless. So simple, isn't it? Very simple. Now look at the second statement of this is again. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. For the scripture says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And then it continues to say, Blessed is the people to whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. We know who the chosen people are. The chosen people are those who have chosen to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and to make him the Lord of their life. Listen very carefully. Salvation comes as a result of accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's a free gift. Amen? But my friend, blessings comes as a result of making him the Lord of your life. Salvation comes as a result of accepting Jesus. Blessings come as a result of making Him the Lord of our life. 
So I think this is a question that we all should ask ourselves and answer sincerely as we examine our own life. Are we among the chosen? Are we among the chosen? Our faithfulness or the lack of our faithfulness will determine our inheritance. And I know this is confusing to a lot of people. We have touched on this quite a few times on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Folks, salvation is a free gift. But inheritance, I believe, is based on your faithfulness. And this inheritance is what we will receive in eternity. This, and I believe it, a part of that will be during the thousand-year reign of Christ as well. We all one day will stand before Jesus Christ, we who are saved, will stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And all of our work as a Christian will be judged. Later, the lost will be judged as well, but that's at the great white throne judgment. So it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the husband whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the wife to whom God is the Lord. Blessed is the father to whom God is the Lord. Blessed is the mother to whom God is the Lord. Blessed is the family to whom God is the Lord. Blessed is the church to whom God is the Lord. My friend, if you haven't discovered this yet, you really need to discover this this morning. There are conditions to blessings. Amen? There are conditions to blessings. If you want to be blessed, simply do what God will bless. It's not complicated. And I read over in Psalms chapter 9 where it says, All nations that forget God will be destroyed. Wow, that makes me nervous. It really does. I love America. But I'm very concerned about the direction that we have gone in the last 50 years, especially. Especially. Last year, we looked at Romans chapter 10. And I want us to look at it very briefly again this morning. I want you to notice what it says in verse 1. The Apostle Paul, speaking here, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul knew his country was in trouble. And because he knew his country was in trouble, he stops and prays for his country. He believed that the only hope for Israel was Jesus Christ. And I believe we have to all agree that the only hope for America is the same. It's Jesus Christ. He believed that there was hope for Israel. He believed that. But I'm convinced that he believed that there was hope for Israel or he had never prayed this prayer. He prayed this prayer because he went to the one that he believed could change things. And he believed what was needed for Israel is for them to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah of all who would believe and put their trust in him. We all know that God had chosen Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But we see that his people, the burden for his people, the concern for his people, it never left. It never left him. 
Paul wanted all people to be saved. Amen. And I realize that this is no longer a political correct statement, but all lives mattered to Paul. And all lives should matter to us as well. Amen. Not certain group of people, but all lives should matter. We see here that he had a strong burden for his people. Folks, we all should have a strong burden for the gospel message to reach the uttermost parts of the world. Amen? But I am convinced today that one of the greatest mission fields in the world is America. Somehow, we have got to convince people under the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is still the Savior and that He is, wants to be the Lord of their lives. Would you agree with me that this nation is blessed because of her relationship with God through Jesus Christ, her friendship to Israel, and the, and the ability and the desire to take the word of God unto the uttermost parts of the world? I believe that. I believe that we're blessed because of those things. I'm convinced that we are because of that. Notice again, Romans 10.1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Today, what I'd like for us to do is, brethren, our heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, but change it to America. That she might be saved. Should we pray God bless America? Or maybe a more appropriate prayer would be, God put America in a position that you can bless her. Put America in a position that you can bless her. Folks, I, I, still, I still believe there's hope. That's why I'm encouraging us to pray and do all we can to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know this country has gone through some terrible times in the past. This country has gone through much more terrible times than what she's going through now. Think back during the Revolutionary War. Think, think about just a moment for the, uh, during the Civil War. That was a terrible time. Terrible time. Thousands and thousands of people lost their lives during the Civil War, and many of them was fighting family against family and brother against brother. It was a terrible time. For this country. But this country overcame that. Amen. It was because of their stand for God. But folks, I've never in my life seen our country in such lawlessness as she is today. Folks, we are seeing the result of what happens when a nation forgets God. When a nation whose God is not the Lord. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that she might be saved. The Apostle Paul knew that the majority of the Jews were not saved. He knew that. The Jews had religion, but they did not have salvation. Notice verse 2 of this chapter. He says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. The Apostle Paul had a zeal of God before he was ever saved, did he not? He was going around torturing Christians, having them thrown in jail, holding people's coats as the Christians was being killed and stoned to death. And he thought he was doing God's work. And Israel probably thought they was doing God's work. But they weren't. They were not. And I'm reminded, I believe, that many people in this country today, they have a zeal of God, but not according to the Word of God. Not according to the Word of God. Notice the next verse. 
For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. There you go. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Yes, that's America. And then the next verse says this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That's our hope. To everyone that believeth. They had a form of religion. They had their rituals, but not a relationship with God. Do you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night in John chapter 3? He was a religious man. He was one of the leaders. And you remember what Jesus told Nicodemus he needed? It's the same thing that people need today. You must be born again. And folks, that's the need that we need to do is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that need Jesus Christ. So what about our country? What about America? Where we are today did not happen overnight. It was a gradual process under the direction of Satan himself. We, we, know, we know that. Under the direction of Satan himself. I want to share with you some downfalls of this country. Pay close attention. In 1962, the Supreme Court ruled against prayers in school. In 1963, the Bible was outlawed, was outlawed in public schools. Still schools do it, many today, but it's outlawed. In the 80s, the Ten Commandments began to be removed from the schools and even courthouses and other governmental buildings. By the way, I don't even like the phrase governmental buildings because it's buildings owned by the people, amen? Eventually, the name of Jesus Christ would be banned in our schools. I'm told today, and I don't know this to be a fact, some of you are school teachers, you could verify this or not verify this, but I'm told today that you cannot wear a shirt to school with a Christian message on it in some schools. That it's not right, it's not appropriate, and you'll be asked to take the shirt off or turn it out, inside out. Eventually, Satan's plan is that we grow up a group of people that don't know anything about God. Folks, we're almost there. Satan's doing a very good job. America has enjoyed blessings from God, but these, these blessings in, are conditional if they are to continue. We read that earlier. Again, Psalms 917 says, All nations that forget God will die. Do you know how you forget something? I'm telling you, Satan's got a great plan. Do you know how you forget something? You stop being exposed to it. We've all heard the terminology, out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. Satan's plan is to raise up a group of people that is no longer exposed to the word of God or anything to do with God. And over the last 50 years, America has systematically pushed God out. I can remember a time when you could build a church building and people would come. You remember that? I can remember a time when you would have a revival meeting and people would come to the revival meeting. Lost people would come. Church people and unchurched people would come. Today, we can't even hardly get our church people to come to church on Sunday morning. Much less others. Folks, what, regardless of what is taught by others, this nation was founded on Christian principles. And I don't know how in the world I can convince you of that if you're not convinced of that other than share some stuff with you. This nation was founded on Christian principles. Listen to this. <clears throat> Back in 1776,
before they ever begin to consider the Declaration of Independence, they prayed and they fast to God for God's guidance. Let's go back even further. In 1504, Christopher Columbus wrote this. He says, I was led of the Holy Spirit to carry the message of the gospel to an undiscovered lands. He came so he could share the message of God to undiscovered lands. The Mayflower Compact stated that they had came for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith. They had a purpose. The Rhode Island Compact says, We submit our persons, our lives, our estates, unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can research all of this. The Primitive Charter was established and said, To advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God and Almighty. The Delaware Charter declares that the purpose of their colony was to further propagate the Holy Gospel. The Virginia Charter instructs the people to propagate the Christian religion to such a people who yet live in ignorance of the true knowledge of God. <laughs> and I stated earlier, before they began the process of the Declaration of Independence, they prayed and they fasted. And let's talk about the role of Christian pastors in the past in America. Did you know that it was a pastor? Actually, he was a Baptist pastor. He wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. Did you know that it was a pastor, actually a Baptist pastor, who wrote, My Country Tis of Thee? Did you know it was a pastor? And I hate, I hate to keep repeating this to those that are not Baptists, but and he was a Baptist pastor who greatly influenced the First Amendment. What does the First Amendment say? I want to read it to you because some folks have really confused it. And this was a Baptist pastor that influenced. As a matter of fact, there was a bunch of preachers got together and they really talked to, I forget who the guy they talked to. Was it Jefferson? I don't remember now who they talked to. It says, Congress shall make, this is what the First Amendment eventually says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, provic, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then the rest of it talks about the free speech and the free press. But I want to read it one more time. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Where in the world they got separation of church and state from that, I don't know. But what it simply means is government cannot interfere with religion. That's what it means. That the gov They did not want the government, <coughs> what they did, see what they did in Great Britain, they had a state church. They did not want that in America. And they did not want the government to interfere in any way in what Christian churches was doing. And Baptists believed that that amendment should pass. We even believe that you should have the freedom to worship even if you don't worship the way we do. Amen? We believe that strongly. But there was pastors that wanted that done. Now listen to this. Some of you, this will shock you, and some of you, it will not. Did you know that over 90% of all the American college presidents were preachers of the gospel before the Civil War? 90%. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, William and Mary, Columbia, were all founded by Christian preachers. Every one of them. 
Pastor John Harvard started the Harvard University that stated the purpose of the university was this. Listen to this. That every student be instructed to know God and Jesus Christ, to lay Christ as the foundation of all knowledge and learning, and let everyone seriously seek Christ Jesus as Lord and Master. Now, I don't know what they're doing at Harvard today. But when it was started by a preacher, that was the purpose. That was the purpose. As a matter of fact, there was a seal um, over the, somewhere on the campus, it was in Latin, that actually states, truth for Christ and the church. And I'm told that seal is still there, but it's in Latin. Nobody can read it, I don't guess. Columbia University wrote, the chief things that are aimed at the college are to teach to know God and Jesus Christ and to love and serve Him. Columbia University. I could go on and on. Folks, pastors have played a very important part in the early history of this country. A year or two ago, Steve Davis introduced me to a, a, a video called The Black Robed Regiment. Matter of fact, I have the link to that video. If any of you want to watch it, send me a note. I'll send you the link that you can go watch it. I want you to see just a portion of that on the screen. To the pulpit we owe the moral force which won our independence. They prepared for the struggle and went into battle not as soldiers of fortune but with the Word of God in their hearts and trusting in Him. England sent her armies to compel submission and the colonists appealed to heaven. There was a time in America when the Christian church led out in the defense of liberty. The 18th century church was, for all practical purposes, the center of American society. Now certainly not everyone in early America considered themselves devoted followers of Christ, but even those who did not still had a healthy respect for the Bible and its teachings. Now this placed the pastors of that period in a unique position of influence. What they believed and what they preached had a significant impact on the people around them. It should still today, amen. I encourage you uh, to watch that. Maybe you can find it somewhere on some of your networks, but if you want the link, I'd be more than happy to send you that link. I believe pastors still have the responsibility to lead in the Christian faith and to lead in the truth that this country was founded upon. By the way, did you know that America's first school book was called the New England Primer? And it even had the Lord's Prayer on the cover. And I think Congress paid for that. On the back of the dollar bill is the seal of the pyramid. Above is the eye of God. It is surrounded by the words in Latin that says, God has smiled upon our beginnings. And did you know that since 1865, all of our currency has the words, In God we trust. Don't tell me this country was not founded on Christian principles, folks. It was. So what can we do as Christians? Well, we're the silent min minority. But I think it's time that we begin to speak up and stand for what's right. And let me tell you something that's even a little bit more difficult than standing for what's right. And this is where it separates many people. We should also stand against that which is wrong. And speak out against that which is wrong. I'm not asking you to be political. I'm not concerned whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or nothing. But I believe we do have a responsibility to stand for what this Bible teaches right here. We'll never get political in this pulpit as long as I'm the pastor. We're not going to promote one president over the other, but we're going to promote the truth, amen, over that which is not the truth. I can't conclude this message without telling you what we as God's people can do. 
And I guess we could preach another few hours just a little bit on, on, on all of this. But notice what this scripture says in 2 Chronicles 7.14. We've, we've read it many times. This puts a responsibility on a certain group of people. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Who is it speaking to? My people. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I still believe this. I know this is for Israel. I understand that. Folks, I believe it'll work for America. Why in the world are we been so quiet about what's going on in the world in which we live? This country is passing laws to protect sin and even to the point of promoting sin. And it's not right. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for America is that she might be saved. And then in Psalms 33, 12, one more time, bring that scripture up again. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want our nation to continue to be blessed until the rapture. Amen. I think we're still blessed even today in many, some areas because of God's people, because of the message that we share with others. <clears throat> I believe this Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 7.14 can be done again. And I, can, I believe it can even begin with us here at this church, if my people who are called by my name, my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Matthew 24, 12 says this, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Brother Terry, we could preach a message on that one right there, couldn't we, brother? Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. The love for God, the love for others, has waxed cold. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for America is that she might be saved. I don't know where your relationship with God is. Those that are watching online, the first step is salvation. Amen. We talked about that this past Sunday night and as we had our recommitment service when we recommitted ourselves to Jesus Christ, our relationship with him, our vision, our mission of our church, and making a commitment to make disciples. Folks, we've got to get into the business of making disciples or we're going to lose this battle. We've got to get into the business of making disciples. There are still folks out there that do not know Christ as their Savior. And the Bible does say, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless somebody tells them? God help us. Would you join with me in praying for our country? And then as we pray, would you simply add to your prayer this simple prayer? God, what part can I play? What part can I do to help the continuation of blessings in the United States of America. I think it really truly, truly begins with 
I surrender all. Would you stand very quietly and reverent with me as we prepare for an invitation? Terry's going to come and lead us in this song. Father, dear Lord, I just pray that your will be done in each and every heart here this morning. God, let it begin with this pastor of recommitting myself to you and to your word and to your purpose and to your ministry. Father, I just pray that each of us here this morning would truly surrender ourselves to you and be willing to do whatever you ask us to do. And Father, as we think about celebrating the 4th of July today, let's think about how many more 4th of Julys will we celebrate if our nation is not brought back to you. Father, I encourage you to speak to each heart that's in this service, each heart that's watching now or later that would be willing to surrender all to your cause. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we sing.